I had five different dreams of royalties coming to me. I was doing at the same time I was doing collector's plates. I was also doing prints and posters in the Christian market. And my work became one of the number one selling Christian prints in the nation for quite a few years. I was doing um, something else I was doing, but but it, it all just started happening at one time. And then there was this famous uh, artist who did a, a line of black figurines uh, called Sarah's Attic. And it was these cute little black kids. Weren't a lot of black collectibles at the time. But she came to me and she said, Thomas, you're a really amazing artist. Have you ever th thought about doing a black figurine line? And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. And she said, you need to think about that because I believe if you did it, you probably it would probably be very successful. And I was like, nah, I'm not interested. But she planted that seed in my brain and it just took root, root. And then at the time, I got on with the Greenwich Workshop. Mm. And, and then that opened me up to this world of all these famous artists that did print work. Right. So I started doing that. And at the time, James Gurney, mm. he was doing the Dinotopia series Dinotopia, yeah. and he was just doing paintings. So he did paintings first and then he created a story around the paintings. And so here all of a sudden he creates this book and it just I, I, I'm seeing this guy change from a regular guy into a millionaire overnight because of this book he did. And then I just kept thinking about his concept of an island that nobody knew about and where um, dinosaurs and, and human beings live together and work together right. in a little bit. And I said, what a cool concept. And I started thinking about what that lady said to me. And I said, if I ever created a black line of figurines, I use James Bur uh, Gurney's idea of coming up with an island where these people were philosophers and scientists and doctors and uh, artists and educators and the whole bit. And they drew from cultures all over the world. And the only difference was they were all black. And that's this concept I came up with. And a month or so later, I get a call from a company saying, um, Thomas, we want you to do a, a, a line of black figurines. And I said, really? And they said, yeah. I said, okay, what do you want? You want Africana kind of stuff? They go, yeah, yeah, we want that, we want that. I said, okay, how about how about uh, uh, jazz musicians playing instruments and stuff like that? You want that too? They go, yeah, yeah, we want that. I said, how about uh, these black people dancing and stuff? You want that too? They said, yeah, we want that. I said, yeah, I'm not interested. Yeah, they said, what? <laughs> they said, what? I said, I said, no, I'm not interested. They said, why not? I said, because every time somebody does a black figurine, that's all they ever do. Right. And I said, I said, if I did a figurine, I'd do something you never saw before. And they said, you would? I said, yeah. They said, well, you got any sketches on that? I said, well, I could get some. <laughs> and they said, well, why don't you put together a series of drawings and present it to us and see, let's see what we can do with it. I said, okay. And that's when... I started that, and that's how Ebony Visions came into being, which was my uh, black figurine line, which was the number one selling black figurine in the nation for 20 years. Wow. And that's why a lot of people hadn't seen me do artwork in enough because I was so busy doing that. It was the most lucrative thing I had ever done in my life. And um, it just took off like a rocket. And um, I learned a lot doing Ebony Visions. I learned about the psychology of the consumer. Mm -hmm. I learned about um, um, how to create something that would be appealing to the consumer. I learned about um, the different products you could produce and stuff like that. Things were just happening like crazy. And uh, I was always trying to push the boundaries, uh, even though the company, they would try to you know, put restraints on me and say, well, no, we can't do this stuff. I was always trying to push the boundaries because I had an open field. This thing became the number one seller and took this little company and turned it into this huge uh, corporation and stuff. And um, I learned so much from doing Ebony Visions. And uh, the, that even helped, ha has helped me with what I'm doing with the Western uh, 
work that I'm doing now and stuff. So how, uh, has, that, how has it helped you in that? Okay. Uh, it's helped me because I learned a lot about the people who buy what I sell. And I've learned how to uh, understand what appeals to people. I've been able to come up with a blessing from God. I've been able to come up with an idea of how to create artwork that I like, but the consumer also likes, mm. you know, that's the perfect place to be, you know? And, um, and I know a lot about what turns people on. I call it the, the bling bling factor. Mm. Uh, and um, I learned how to market myself and, uh, just to give an example, you 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 know my Western artwork and stuff. Just like when I came up with uh, a, a genre for myself, Western Nouveau. Yeah, you know, that that came out of understanding how to sell myself and stuff from working on those figurines and stuff. Yeah, and, and that so, that is your style. I do see it in all your paintings. You know, yeah. I mean, the one you just did of. Uh, I think it was called Neon Cowboy. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. saw that one, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. The only thing I'm mad about is I didn't own it because it's great. <laughs> well, I, the, I, I was kind of wondering, it's like, you know, why isn't somebody picking this thing up? So it, it's sold now, but I mean, it's like, well, you know, so. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, unbelievable. And that scarf, I mean, that whole thing to me, even I wore this in honor of you, kind of this uh, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> You need to be doing some shirt lines. I, I <laughs> well, yeah. well, that that neon cowboy has that is the beginning of a whole new series of images that I'm going to be doing that will be called the neon cowboy series. Love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I and they just there's a style there. There's a sensibility that I can see in your work. The way the hat pulls up even around his face. You know, it's got that. There's just some. It's it's. I mean, like you said, it's Western Nouveau. Yes, yeah. it really is you. That's uh, rare. Yeah. You can make your own style. Well, <laughs> I don't know about making my own style, but at least the genre. I mean, I mean, in the Western market, it was like there's nobody else doing it. I right. might as well. I might as well try it. You know, so <laughs> you know it's because like, this, this I was say, well. that comes from that doing those figurines learning the aspects of how to understand the psychology of what art is well it's just like uh, another thing that i teach my students is you got to understand who the consumer is and what they like you also have to understand uh, the appeal in what you create you also have to understand how you want to draw the uh, you want to get the viewer's attention on that. So there's certain things that I've learned about creating, whether it's a painting, sculpture, whatever, that will uh, get somebody interested in it just by the way you design. It. Mm. Uh, and that means and it's been done for so many years. You got to understand how to bring sex appeal into certain things when you do it, because this attracts men and women when they're buying stuff and they're looking at some of the stuff that you're showing. I know like with the figurines, I knew exactly how much to um, pump this man's behind up for the women who were going to be buying this figurine of this angel. You know, mm -hmm. I knew how much to do uh, a little uh, showing the shoulder a little bit for this woman, for the men who might buy that figurine. It's a, it, it's a whole psychology that they've been using in advertising for decades because they understand how to draw the attention of the people that they're trying to sell products to. Mm -hmm. And so when you finish working, doing those figurines, what was that next step? Cause that was super successful. You well, 20 years. That, well, that's when everything fell apart. Mm. What happened was I was working for um, Linux, the plate company. Mm -hmm. They bought my contract for the figurines. My contract came to an end and um, I decided I wasn't going to renew it. And the reason why I wasn't going to renew it was because there were certain things that had gone on while I was with the company that weren't handled the way that I felt they should have been handled. And I felt it was time for me to move on. 
So I let them know I wasn't I wasn't going to resign with them. And they got really mad, you know, mm -hmm. because they were losing money. They were losing a lot of money and stuff. And so I just said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. And it was my right to do that. I had fulfilled my contract. Well, they came up with a bogus way to sue me. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they did some dirty stuff. And I'm not going to go into detail, but they did some dirty stuff. And they sued me and messed up my life for about three years, three, three, three and a half years. Mm. But uh, thank God I, I won my case. But unfortunately, because of what they did, I'm not I'm no longer doing Ebony Visions. And what's so crazy about it is. They have the uh, trademark rights to Ebony Visions, but they can't do Ebony Visions without my name tied to it. Mm. So they're in a stalemate. They they own the thing, but they can't do nothing with the property. You know, so it's just ridiculous because if it wasn't for that, I would still have a multi-million dollar product that I would be doing right now. But, you know, that's just the way it is sometimes. So when that happened, that had to be devastating. You've got I lost, well, unfortunately, the reason why I was so devastating was because at the same time they were suing me. Mm -hmm. I was going through a divorce with my wife and it was the worst time of my life. But uh, So on one side, it was her and the divorce and her lawyers and the judges. And on the, the other side was Lennox. And it ended up where um, by the time of my divorce in 2016, I lost everything, mm. everything. Um, I had no job, didn't have a way of making a living nothing and um that was a hard time i mean that was that was 2006 that was a really hard time what happened was january 1st 2016 i get an email from morgan weissman mm -hmm. and because morgan and i were friends and he said and i hadn't talked to him in a while after he became you know real famous and all that stuff right and he just said, Thomas, I've been trying to get in touch with you and I've been trying to get a hold of you for a month now. And I said, oh. so I, I had his number still. So I just called him up and I'm like, you called me, Morgan? You you trying to get in touch with me? <laughs> and he said, yeah. I said, well, I had your number. So I just thought I'd call you and see, is this real? He said, yeah. He says, Thomas, there's a shift going on in the Western market. And uh, ever since um, John... Um, Garrity. Um, Garrity, yeah. Ever since John Garrity passed away, there's a shift going on in the Western marketplace right now. And there's a lot of new contemporary artists that are becoming really well known. And um, I think you would do very well in this. And I just wanted to call you to let you know whatever I can do to help you. If, if I need to introduce you uh, to museums, to galleries, um, if I need to help you with your website, whatever I can do to help you become a part of this this Western market, I want to do it. And I was just so grateful to him. And he didn't know what had happened to me because we hadn't talked in so long. And I, I let him know what had happened to me. And I said, he said, are you interested? I said, well, yeah. I said, I don't have nothing else. I, yeah, I'm interested. I said, so what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to paint. And he said, and what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll check on you throughout the year. And next year when I go to the Gene Autry Museum, I'm going to, I want to invite you to it. And I want to take you as my guest and I want to try to introduce you to people, see if we can get you in here. I said, well, thanks, Morgan. Sure. So that's what I did. I started working on images and um, put together this little rinky dink portfolio, trying to look like I was a Western painter <laughs> and um, uh, brought it, to, went, went, stayed with Morgan and uh, went to the show. And sure enough, you know, um, he, uh, introduced me to Mary Von Leshy and uh, she she didn't know me and you know I knew her because I, I knew about her mm -hmm. and he introduced he said Thomas this is Mary Von Leshy and he says I'm in her gallery and so he said show her your portfolio I showed her my portfolio she looked at me and said um, are you going to be here tomorrow I said yes I'll be here she said okay we'll talk tomorrow I said okay and so uh, the next day, you know, she was eating lunch, saw me standing by myself. She said, Thomas, come over here and have lunch with me. Went over. We talked for about 45 minutes. To, uh, you know, she says, why don't I know you? 
And I, I just told her, you know, what I've been through and stuff. And she said, after 45 minutes, she looked at me and said, okay, I want you in my gallery. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, so that's how I, I started. Smart art dealer right there. Yeah, don't yeah. mess up. You see it, you sign it, you go, yep. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry I wasn't at that to Autry that year. <laughs> So uh, that's what happened. I, I she I walked away with a gallery and yeah, great gallery. I, I finished some of the paintings I was working on. I sent her the painting after about two and a half weeks, the painting sold. And I'm like, whoa. And then I sent her the other one. That one sold. And then I started sending her more work and they all started selling. And that's how it all started. And that was two, 2017 when the, yeah. they did that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's it's just kind of an amazing ride that you've had this, you know, career. And then all of a sudden you're in a complete different genre. Yeah. I mean, what does that feel like, honestly? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. When I would, before all the craziness happened in my life and during the time of all the craziness, I would see my buddies in the magazines, you know, the Western yeah. magazines winning awards and stuff. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, I could do that. I could do that. And I'm like, wow, I wonder if I could ever get to that point, you know, and thank God it, it happened, you know, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I'm very excited. I, you know, because of where I am, I'm like I said, I'm starting over. I turned what a couple of weeks ago, I turned 67 years old. Yep. I never thought I would be starting over in my 60s. You know, with all the success and the careers I've had and stuff, I just never thought I'd be starting over. And here I am starting over. And this is my shot, and I'm just trying to make the best of it. And, um, you know, and then now, thank God, because of all the opportunities that are coming my way, I'm just trying to learn how to uh, juggle all the opportunities and stuff and really having to say no a lot right now because I got to realize I'm, I'm older and I'm still just one person and I can't be doing all this stuff, but I'll do what I can and just trying to make sure that I can uh, handle it so that I can still enjoy it mm -hmm. because the, 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 the few years I have left on this earth, I want to at least try to enjoy my life a little bit and enjoy the art. I don't want to, I don't want it to, uh, get to a point where I'm hating it because it's just too much pressure. So right. I, I have to make some changes and stuff like that. But uh, but I, I love creating. I love the process. I love trying to, the challenge and trying to do something that I haven't done before or something you, you haven't seen before. I love doing that. It's just trying to learn how to juggle it better and stuff. So. And so you come up with this idea for the Neon Cowboy. Let's just talk about that since that's going to be coming up as a series. Mm -hmm. How, what do you envision on that? I mean, I, I've seen the three images that were the drawing, the watercolor and the oil of what it is, a singular black cowboy looking straight on with this beautiful scar. But what is yeah. that, you know, next series? going? Well, this, this is how it all happened. Uh, you saw the painting I, I did called Two Americans of the Old West yep. that got the award, the um, Pre to West this, this year. Yep. Uh, well, that painting was a, uh, I, I guess that, that that was a new journey for me with that particular painting. And while I was working on it, the debate I had within myself was, okay, what are we going to do? We got these two cowboys here, and you don't usually see that, uh, black cowboys to begin with. I said, so what am I going to do? Am I going to be the artist and make these scarves around their neck, these bandanas around their necks? bright colors or am I going to do a more realistic where they were kind of dull colors and stuff mm -hmm. I said I'm an artist doggone it I do what I want to do let's try the bright colors and I said well I don't know how people are going to feel about this I said well let's try it so I went ahead and put the bright colors on there and to my surprise people loved it mm -hmm. and I said I said to myself okay I got an idea for a whole new series where I do the cowboys in monochromatic colors, mm -hmm. but their vests or their bandanas will be bright colors and call it neon cowboy. 
Mm. So that's that's the idea behind that. Just another look and emphasizing something that you just throw in that splash of color that you would normally put in there and stuff. So, are, are you inspired or or, or um, yeah, inspired is the right word? I think from Kendley Wiley's paintings. I mean his, you know, portraits with these great reliefs on the back, like Obama's painting. I see that in this new series in the way of just the bright, the, the, the design elements. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. I think Kendi Wally is an incredible artist and what he did with that um, hip hop series and what he did with the backgrounds and all that stuff. Amazing. Incredible. I mean, thumbs up. I mean, dude, it's done some, beautiful paintings. I did not like his Obama portrait. I, I I just didn't like it. That has nothing to do with him as an artist because he's an incredible artist. But that that painting just did not do it for me at all. Um, but, you know, you can't take away from the dude's talent. He really knows his stuff. So, Well, it's, it, it, you know, it's interesting. I think we need to do uh, a uh, Thomas Blackshear Obama <laughs> with the cowboy. <laughs> And well, what's what's interesting to me is, you know, there were a few people. I mean, there I know some artists that were asked to do that portrait. Nobody ever asked me. But then again, the truth of the matter is, I'm really not known in a lot of genres. This is the first time in my career since I started in 2017 that I am on the grid of the fine art market. I was never on the fine art market grid. As well as known as I was to a lot of artists and other people, the fine art community didn't even know who I was. So mm -hmm. I'm still I'm still working my way up to getting people to even know I exist because, you know, I even remember when how it was interesting how when I received my first award from the Gene Archer Museum, I think that was 2017 or 2000. Yeah, it was 2017. I received my first award from the Gene Archer Museum. It was kind of funny because, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, let me see. No, 2018 was the first year I received the award. Yeah. You could tell when I went up there to, to get the award, you could tell people were like, who is he? I mean, who, who is he? You know, who is this guy? You know? And because uh, they, they didn't know who I was, hadn't seen me and stuff. And, you know, let's just be honest, there are not a lot of black people in the Western art market. So, you know, but um, that's that's just the way it is. So all this is kind of new for me. And so I'm learning the ropes and all that kind of stuff. And thank God people seem to be interested in what I'm doing. But uh, I'm just glad to know that people are starting to know about me, because, like I said, this is all new for me. Well, I mean, it's that Billy Bob Thornton effect, right? I mean, Billy Bob. You know, he's not known by anybody in Hollywood. He works for 25 years hard. And then all of a sudden he's on top and people are like, oh, he's an overnight success. Well, yeah, except for the 25 years he put in before, and, you know, and you've got 35 yeah. years. I mean, so, yes, I agree. People are you. I'll say right now you're definitely on a lot of people's radar, as you should be, including mine. I mean, I'm collecting your work. I'm putting it in my house. Um, you know, I, I gotta say, if you don't have one of your paintings in your collection and you're a serious Western or native American art collector, you're missing a key cog, you know, because, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. yeah, no, that's a true, that's a true statement. And, you know, yeah. it, the, the problem for you, as you already know, cause we, we had called, I called and talked to you about doing something for my rodeo show. And you were like, talk to me in maybe 2014 or 2024, 25. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Well, yeah, yeah. That's going to be your issues. I think is it's not will it sell. It is, you know, how do I keep up? I'm 67. Who gets it? How do I sell it? You know, luckily, I yeah. again, you know, you've got that 40 years of experience in different industries. So, you know, I think you can navigate that, you know, much easier than probably most people could. No, I'm just I'm just very honored to be amongst some of these incredible artists, man. I mean, the, the, my competition, those guys out there that are doing the Western Army, I mean, they don't play. When I went to the pre-to-west <laughs> and I saw 
you know, what was on those walls, I'm saying, the first thing I say to myself is, I got to up my game because mm -hmm. these guys are the tops of the tops. And, you know, and I, I am inspired by everybody. I mean, I still learn so much from all kind of artists. I mean, I still look at comic book artists. I still look at uh, contemporary artists and Western artists and painters and stuff. And I, I absorb and pick up and, 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 and grow, try to grow and learn and the, the abstract uh, emphasis in a painting as opposed to the realistic and then the approaches to painting and, and how you use the brush, all of that stuff. I'm still, I'm still learning. I'm still growing and learning because uh, I just want to use it all to be the best me I can be. So. Well, I think every great artist that I have had the privilege of being around has that same inspiration that they never feel they're there. You know, no yeah. matter how good they are, you know, they're like, no, nope, I can work on it. I can get better. I've heard it from people like Ed Mel saying it to me, you know, or not even, you know, I remember watching him one time looking at a, a Maynard Dixon going, wow, I just, you know, that guy is so good, you know, and you can see it. He's oh, like, yeah. I got to, you know, how do I keep my game at another level? What can I do to make my, you know, my work better? And so clearly you have that. That's almost like a check mark for me. When I hear an artist say that, that means, you know, that they are going to surprise me. They're going to uh, excite me with what's going to come out. And, um, you know, and you better be following that person. That's, that's an artist. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny that you were bringing up Maynard Dixon. That's how I came up with our uh, Western Nouveau. Um, you know, I looked at what was going on in the Western art market. And I said to myself, my goodness, how do I stand out from all these people? Because they're so good. Then you look at people like Logan Maxwell, Hedges, and uh, then you look at Mark Majori and all these people, you know, and you know, I'm saying to myself, almost so many of these artists, they have been influenced just like I've been influenced by Maynard Dixon. Yeah. And I said, Maynard Dixon, why are they so influenced by it? Because the man took Art Deco and married it with the Western theme. And I said, and all these guys are following him. And I said, most of the people do that Maynard Dixon thing, which is incredible because I love Maynard Dixon. But I said, what can I do? And I said, I've always liked Art Nouveau, but I've never seen anybody marry that with the Western theme. I said, doggone it, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do Western Nouveau. And uh, I just like it. Um, that I, I'm just excited that people seem to like what I'm doing. One of the things that was very calculated, though, was I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to get pigeon. Uh, uh, what is it, pigeonholed in, yeah, in, pigeonholed. in, in this? Yep. Yeah, in this genre, because yep. as an illustrator, there were times I was pigeonholed, and I, I said to myself, I don't want to deal with that no more because. I remember one time I, I had done quite a few uh, pieces for Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company. Now this is a multi-billion dollar corporation that has all kind of uh, uh, ads and things that, and, and, and uh, what do you call them? Um, series, what, what is it when they do a whole series of uh, uh, campaigns, all kind of campaigns on different products and stuff like that. I noticed that Coca-Cola would only give me artwork for black stuff mm. and I, you know, and I do everything. And I called the art director at one time. I said, why are you always giving me black stuff? I said, I do everything. Why, why don't you ever consider me for any of these other things? Right. They say, well, you, you've got black stuff in your portfolio. I said, yeah, but it's, it's not all black. I got half black, I got half white. I mean, why, why did you just think of me like that? Right. And so I learned something from that. So I said to myself, when I went into the Western market, I said, I'm not going to let them pitch and hold me no more because it, be, it would be so easy to do. Yes. You know? Right. So I, I said, OK, I said, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out with three different styles. So I said, I can do the realistic. Then I'll also do the stylized, which is a neon cowboy stylized. Mm -hmm. And I can do the decorative. And so those are the, the categories that I do. So that way I can do whatever I want when I want, and it'll still be me. And, and, now, I'm working, uh, and now I'm working on the new one, which is contemporary. So that's the other thing I'm adding to what I do now is the contemporary uh, look. And 
the um, neon cowboy and even the cow the boys. If you saw the boys uh, painting, yeah, yeah, that's the beginning of me moving into the contemporary. Um, so it's going to be a lot more abstract in uh, some respects than it is right now. So, um, but that's that's where I'm moving into too. So, do you feel a pressure because you're 67? You've been doing the cowboy uh native american genre since 2017 you feel pressure to try to make a body of work that's going to you know have legs for your really for your legacy um to, to have that done you know and a you know you've got 20 years to to, to you know to make that I'll be, I'll, be honest with you. I'll be honest with you i don't i don't really think about that much yeah I don't think I mean I, I I'm very aware of, it, but yeah. I don't let that be my motivation. Got it. I just I just want to do. You know what my real motivation is? I want to get back to having fun doing art. Mm. That's my mo. I want I want to do something exciting that excites me and, and is so much fun mm. that I just can't. I I just love it and I want to get back to that. It, that's why when I get all this pressure because everybody wants me and everybody wants me to do it. <laughs> I, I, I can't, you know, I just, because I have this thing in me. I know where I can take something. The problem is if I don't have the time to take it there, then it will not be what I knew it could have been. And that just drives me nuts, mm. you know? And sometimes that, uh, well, quite a few times that, that doesn't happen. But when it does happen, man, it's so sweet. When you can do something that you knew, knew I took it where I knew I could take it. Mm. And when I'm not able to do that, I get real frustrated uh, mm. when I don't have the time to do that. That's so like going right back to your art school, right? I mean, finishing up the A's and the F's, finishing up, you know, yeah, until you yeah, had it yeah, perfect. Yeah. 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 So that kid's still yeah, there. Right. I'm still there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I guess, like I said, because I know what's in here and I want everybody to see where it could have been, Yeah, you know, so. One of the things you do that I, uh, you know, because I, I, I love Dixon. He's an area I've specialized in. I have a museum for him. And one of the things he's great about is his drawings. He's an incredible draftsman. And one of the things I love about what you're doing is you're putting your drawings out there for sale as well. In fact, I've collected a couple of those already. But um, tell me a little bit about that because they are so, uh, they're just great, actually. I appreciate it. Well, this is, this is my process. I didn't think much about selling my drawings for a long time, only because, um, I don't know, I get, I just, I just didn't, didn't think anybody would want some raggedy drawing sitting around, you know. <laughs> but what it is is this. Because of the vision I have inside of myself of, of where I could take a piece, I have to lay everything out and I have to uh, work, uh, work in stages to get to a certain point to bring that painting to life. Right. Um, I don't take the chance and just throw it on that canvas and see what happens. I have a vision and I'm gonna to try to get as perfect as I can in that vision and bring that to life. And what that means is that begins with the drawing. So I remember when I, I started teaching, a lot of my students were so uh, blown away by the fact that when I do a drawing for a painting, if that thing is not working, I could do that drawing. I, I could I could do the sketch one time and it'll work. If it doesn't work, I could do that drawing six to eight times to make sure it works. And I, I guess a lot of students were blown away. It's like, well, why why do you keep doing this? I said because it wasn't right. In my mind, I know what it could have been, and it's got to be right to me. If that drawing is not right, and that's something else I learned from Mark English, if that drawing does not work in a thumbnail, mm. it won't work as a big painting. 
Yep. So you start with that thumbnail, and if that thumbnail is not working, you better keep working until that thumbnail works because that painting's not going to work. Mm. Okay, now once you get past that, once you get that drawing and that drawing is correct, you got to make sure you keep drawing it until you get it to where you know you could have taken that drawing. And I will do that because I I don't just want to throw stuff out there that I consider to be junk. I want to throw stuff out there that I know I did the best I could on it, it with, with the time frame I had. And uh, so that's just a part of who I am. And so, um, but the, the main thing is this, I don't even touch that canvas until that drawing is correct. Mm. Uh, and so I don't know what helped me to realize that these things could be valuable was a couple of years ago, I did a seminar, a science, a sci-fi seminar that a friend of mine was teaching. And I even forget what, oh, it was in Wisconsin. I believe it was in Wisconsin. And uh, it, it was a pretty big deal. I had never done it before, but they had a, a lot of uh, really well-known fantasy and sci-fi artists there. Uh, uh, very, very good artists and a lot of students and stuff. And it was a, it was a big deal. So I brought a lot of my prints with me and I brought some of my color ups with me. And um, I don't think I brought that many drawings, but I showed drawings, but I didn't bring any to sell, but mostly color ups. And my color ups are about, you know, five by seven, something like that. I brought those with me and I had about 10 of them maybe. And I had all these prints that I was hoping I would sell. Hardly any of the prints sold. People were buying those color ups like crazy. I mean, I walked out of that seminar with an extra 10 grand. <laughs> and I'm a, I was blown away. I'm like, I cannot believe it, boy. They, they, those things were selling like hotcakes. <laughs> I said, dog, they, I said, they want that, and, and they did. They wanted it because they said we can't afford the original, but we want these colorists. And I said, okay. And then I said, wow. People had told me for many years I should be doing that, and I, I didn't listen to them. And I said, okay, I get it now. So that's when I started realizing people do want these, and so. That's why I sell those drawings and, and uh, the color ups like that. So, yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can right. see your skill, your skill set, too, is and, and I've looked, you know, I've got some of the drawings that were for paintings and you can see that, you know, you can see. Yep. He had to do that to get it to there. And same with Dixon. He did the same thing. And you'll find this very interesting with Dixon. He'd do these little two by three drawings, too, that would end up looking very much like a 30 by 40. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'll send you an image of some of the things he did, and you'll go, mm-hmm, yep, that's what I do, too. Yeah, uh, yeah that, as far as, because like I said, I learned that from Mark, and it's kind of funny, because when I try to get my students to understand how important it is, I don't know what it is. They they just don't seem to want to do a thumbnail. And it's like, why do a big canvas that you're going to end up throwing away because you couldn't figure out what you were supposed to do? All you got to do is work it out and just have it as a pattern so that when you start that thing, you know you're going to finish it. That's one reason why I do all that, because I don't have time to be throwing away money <laughs> get to stretch my canvas and stuff like that. When I do a painting, that thing will be finished. Right. So, so I have to go through the process. And when I don't go through the process and I run into those situations where I got to figure it out, all the time that you're wasting trying to, you know, because it didn't work and then you do it again and it didn't work and you do it again. Nah, you save yourself time and get it done. Get on there. You know what you're going to do. You don't have to worry about it. So. Yeah. Well, Thomas, you've been doing this now for 40 years. I know you've been an artist all your life. Kind of we're finishing it up to the podcast and I would like you just to maybe address to those people who are out there trying, maybe they're in the position you were, where they're trying to switch the career, they're not they're not hitting where they're supposed to be. What advice would you give those individuals, those artists out there? I'm going to give you the advice Mark English gave me. And I never forgot it. I said to him, Look, Mark, um, I'll, 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 I'll give you uh, a couple of uh, advice. Uh, a couple of times he gave me advice. I asked him one time, do you get mad at people who um, try to steal your, your technique or, and your look and try to copy you on everything you do? I said, does that bother you? He said, well, you know, they say uh, 
that's a form of flattery. I say, yeah, I know about that. And he says, and he says, no, I don't mind it much. And I, and I said, well, why not? He said, because I've come to realize that when you're an innovator, you don't have nothing to worry about. Mm. And I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, the fact is this, when you do something that people really admire and really like, and they, they want to follow you, they will always follow you because they don't know what your next step is. Mm-hmm. So that cre- that causes you to be an innovator because you don't have to worry about them following you. They'll never catch up because they never know where you're coming from to do what you're doing. And so I never forgot that. Then I asked him one time, how do you change your style? How do you change your style? And he said, well, this is what I would tell you to do. If you want to change a, your look or change your style, go to the old masters or go to the people, the old artists that are long gone that you admire. And what you do is you learn how to dissect what they do in their artwork. A lot of people say, well, how do you dissect a painting? Well, you got to know about the medium, you got to know about canvas, you got to know about how a brush uh, reacts on the surface of a board or a canvas. Once you understand that stuff, then when you look at paintings, you could pretty much by looking at underpaintings and other stuff that's going on in a painting, figure out what some of the steps were to get there. Now, you might not get it correct, exactly correct every time, but you'll get something that's close to the look. So, So he says, basically, you go to the old guys, the old masters or the people you admire, you look at and study what they're doing. Then you try to incorporate some of the stuff that they do that you admire. But once you do that, then you just tweak it just a little bit and it creates a whole new look. In other words, give them something that's familiar, but by tweaking it, it changes it just a little bit. So it's still familiar, but it's it's also different, and it's yours. That's there the other. You go. Yeah. There you go. So, if people want to find your work, see more about you, is there an Instagram account? I know you have a website. I've been to it. Maybe you can give those to people so they can find your work or follow you. Mainly, um, the website. I got to do a little. I mean, the Instagram account. I got to do a little bit more with that. So I, I'll just kind of leave that one alone for right now. But my website and I will be trying to get that updated too, because I haven't in a while because of, I've been so crazy busy, but the website is Thomas Blackshear art.com. Okay. Simple. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I encourage everybody to go to your website and to follow your work. And there's galleries out there that represent you that you can find them there. And you go, you do a couple different shows, the Prita West, you're doing the Autry. Do you do any other shows at this point? This this year, what I'm going to do is I'll be doing the pre to West, and then I will be doing my first one man show uh, in Midland, Texas, one man museum show, mm. and then I will be doing a two man show, me and Michael Dudash at Le- Legacy Galleries. Both of those shows will be in the fall, so it gives me plenty of time to try to get ready without. Uh, pulling the, the the little hair I still have left out of my head. So <laughs> you look pretty good as far as I'm concerned. You got more hair than I do and you're young, you're a little older than me. At the Midland uh, Museum, will any of that work be available for sale or will it all yeah, be all of it would be for sale. And that what really surprised me, that's the show they wanted me to do all black cowboys. Hmm. So I'm like, okay. So you know. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well it's been a real pleasure talking to you. You know, I'm a fan. I think you're just a, a unique individual. I'm so pleased that you're part of our community and what you're doing is unique and uh, singular. I would even say that. I so, appreciate it. And yeah. I really I really enjoy the fact that you you really got and you really like Neon Cowboy. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. I get it. I definitely love your art. <laughs> when I'm putting money, when I'm writing a check at a gallery, just like anybody else, and I'm putting it on my wall that says, okay, mm-hmm, yep, it needs to be there. So, yeah, I think the problem for most people is going to be able to trying to get your work versus 
you know, this is going to, you know, better go now, guys. Find out the gallery shows he's doing it and put your name in the hat. Thank you very much. And I look forward to following your career and what you do next, and especially watching the Neon Cowboy series that's going to come out. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. All right, Thomas. Thomas Blackshear. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. I'll let you back to work. I know that's exactly where you're headed. Too. <laughs> no, no, not today. I'm just oh. chilling out. My my ex-wife uh, just had uh, knee surgery. And so she didn't have nobody helping her. So I've been trying to help her, but today's my last day. So now tomorrow I'll start back, you know, getting ready. And I can't wait because the stuff I got ready for the next show I'm doing, I'm very excited about. So Yeah, that's exciting. And for people who know, who don't know, Thomas lives in Colorado Springs. He is a Western guy. He's living there. He's involved. You know, you, you see the culture of what the West is. You're around it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's important. I think it helps solidify you know, that imagery when you can have, you know, when you're around the West. Oh, yeah. No, it helps a lot. So. All right. Thomas Blackshear, thank you so much. I'll talk Thanks, to you soon. Mark. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye.